Well, we have some breaking news coming in from the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. A high-rise residential building has been badly shelled in Kyiv. This is according to emergency services in the country. It is not clear at the moment if there are any casualties. The authorities are still assessing the number of victims. But the visual coming in from show, coming in from Kyiv shows officials rescuing injured civilians. They posted a picture of the tower block with a hole covering at least five floors blasted into the site. This comes after Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Kremlin's military operations will not target civilian infrastructures. Once again, this is uh, in Kyiv. A high-rise residential building has been badly shelled in Kyiv. This is according to emergency services in the country. It is not clear at the moment if there are any casualties. The authorities are still assessing the number of victims. But the visuals coming in from Kyiv shows officials rescuing injured civilians. They posted a picture of the tower block with a hole covering at least five floors blasted into the site. This comes after Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Kremlin's military operations will not target civilian infrastructures. While the capital city of Kyiv remains on the edge, other Ukrainian cities are also battling a mounting offensive by Russian forces. The biggest development today comes with southern Ukraine. Russian news agencies say or claim that Russian forces have captured southeastern Ukrainian city of Militopol. The fate of about 150,000 residents of Militopol hangs in the balance. If confirmed, the fall of Militopol would be the first significant population center seized by the Russian forces since the invasion began. Moscow has launched coordinated cruise missile and artillery strikes on several cities. Ukrainian military command say that caliber cruise missile were launched at multiple cities from the Black Sea. Areas near the cities of Sumy, Poltava, Mariupol have been hit by airstrikes. Russia says it has targeted Ukrainian military infrastructure with air and sea-based cruise missiles. Fighting has been underway near southern Ukrainian cities of Mariupol, Kherson, Mykolaiv and Odessa. Mariupol has been witnessing a multi-pronged attack by the Russian forces. Several buildings have been destroyed in shelling. In Kherson, in the south, a massive explosion was reported at a gas station, though the cause of the explosion has not been verified. Eyewitnesses driving meters away from the scene can be heard saying, plane! moments before the explosion occurred. On Friday, CCTV footage showed Russian military vehicles moving in the Kherson region. Military trucks and tanks were seen moving into the city. Numerous Russian military hardware with white painted Z signs on them were seen moving in. In the northern city of Chernihiv, relentless shelling sparked fire at a security service of Ukraine building. The two-story building was hit by shelling and no injuries were reported. Two other cities, Sumy and Konotop in the southeastern Ukraine, have been cut off. Russian Defense Ministry has said Western weapons had been seized, including American Javelin and British law and law anti-tank missiles. Все российскими вооруженными силами выведены из строя 211 военных объектов инфраструктуры вооруженных сил Украины. Среди них 
17 пунктов управления и узлов связи Вооруженных сил Украины, 19 зенитных ракетных комплексов противовоздушной обороны С-300 и ОСА, 39 релационных станций. Сбито 6 боевых самолетов, 1 вертолет, 5 беспилотных летательных аппаратов. Уничтожено 67 танков и других боевых бронированных машин, 16 реактивных систем залпового огня и 87 единиц специальной военной автомобильной техники. Ulian Blaka is an associate professor of comparative East European culture at the University College London, and he is now joining us live. Welcome to We On, Professor Blaka. Thank you, Professor. What do you make of these statements by the by Russia that the Kremlin wants to free Ukraine from oppression? Well, it's ridiculous, and as with many uh, statements made by the Kremlin, you simply take it and turn it upside down, and you'll get the truth. Um, Ukraine is a country which has democratic free elections, it regularly has uh, changes of power, changes of government, changes of president. Uh, Russia has had the same president for 20 years and does not have free elections. Um, it does not have freedom of speech. Ukraine has freedom of speech. Um, so if you know, there's a country in this region where people are being oppressed, it's certainly not Ukraine, um, it's Russia. Professor, French President Emmanuel Macron says the world should be prepared for long war in Ukraine. Is that a confirmation of a reality that we will have to live with? And what might have prompted Macron to say that? Um, well, obviously we have to hope that uh, that won't be the case. Um, but at the moment it's extremely difficult to predict. Um, you know, we've seen the uh, the Kremlin becoming involved in uh, and Russia becoming involved in numerous conflicts over the years. Some of those have been short, relatively short, as in Georgia in 2008. Some of those have been uh, longer and more protracted. Um, it's difficult to know what uh, what Russia will do if it will really try to uh, hang on. If it tries to hang on and occupy Ukraine and implement regime change. You know, and really try to um, to turn Ukraine around as a state and force it back into Russian sphere of influence, uh, then this could be a very long and protracted, protracted uh, war because Ukrainians will resist uh, very, very fiercely. And they have been already. I think that, you know, the Russian military has suffered enormous losses just in the last uh, couple of days. Um, I think they've, they've experienced losses that they were not expecting. Um, and it will not be easy to, to, sub, to, to subjugate Ukraine. So unfortunately, if, if the Kremlin doesn't pull out, if it doesn't back down, uh, this, this could unfortunately go on for a long time. And that's why it's really, really important that we get swift, decisive and significant action from uh, the West on this. Professor Blaka, kindly stay with me because I want your insights uh, in regards to this next story. Now, with tensions mounting over what lies ahead for Kyiv and Zelensky government, an Ukrainian government's spokesperson has now said that Kyiv and Moscow are continuing consultations regarding the place and time of a possible peace talks. In his latest Facebook post, Ukraine's spokesperson, Sagi Nikiforov, has said that Ukraine is always ready for peace talks and denied an earlier Kremlin statement that said Ukraine has rejected U Russia's offer to, ne to negotiate. The development comes as Russian forces continue to march forward to siege the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv and overturn Zelensky's government. Kremlin said earlier on Friday that it had offered to meet Ukrainian officials in the Belarusian capital of Minsk, but that Ukraine had instead proposed Warsaw as a venue. These differences unfortunately led to a pause in confirming a new place for the negotiations. Russia's military invasion has now entered its third day, with the latest reports indicating that Russian troops are heading towards the capital from several directions. Putin launched the military attack on Ukraine on Thursday, days after recognizing two separatist-held enclaves in eastern Ukraine as independent regions. Professor, thank you very much for staying on. What seems to be ignored here is the humanitarian catastrophe as a result of this conflict. What can the world do apart from protests to rally for and even possibly save Ukrainians? 
Yeah, this is a great question. I think we are now seeing the development of a refugee crisis uh, in Europe. Um, it's been very heartening to see Ukraine's Western neighbors open up their borders. Uh, so Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Romania, Moldova have been very quick to act to help people fleeing uh, the conflict, uh, to fleeing, fleeing the Russian invasion. Um, we have to see action from the Western European countries as well, because we can't expect um, Ukraine's Western neighbours to uh, take the entire burden. You know, we could be seeing millions of refugees. I've seen estimates of, of up to five million. Um, this could be even uh, larger than the the the, the, um, the migrant crisis uh, of a few years ago, when Germany took uh, uh, lots of uh, lots of migrants from the Middle East. Um, so far, the reaction of the British government, for example, has been poor on this. Um, they've, uh, they've, in fact, been restricting um, access to visas for Ukrainians, uh, which is the opposite of what they should be doing. They should be op opening up a clear route for Ukrainian refugees to come uh, to the United Kingdom, and all Western European countries should be doing that. Um, but there are also many things that uh, the West can do that it hasn't done, you know, cutting Russia off from uh, SWIFT, uh, implementing a no-fly zone over over Ukraine. I know that's uh, our government has rejected that because it believes it would it would draw um, NATO into uh, a conflict. But at the moment, uh, Russian bombs are raining down in Ukrainian cities. Um, we also have to be much more severe uh, with sanctions on uh, on Russians, on Russian assets. You know what we saw at the beginning of this week, in, uh, the, uh, announced by the British government, was very small scale, very weak. They have uh, they have uh, bolstered that they've introduced uh, more severe sanctions, but it, it has to go much further. So there's still a lot more we can do. Well, at this moment, Professor, who do you think Russia is bullying? Is it Ukraine, the West, or NATO? Despite Russian leaders claiming that they are willing to negotiate, only if Ukraine backs down or lays down their weapons. Yeah, well, we've seen, you know, Russian negotiations are generally carried out at the at the, at the, at the end of a barrel of a gun. You know, the, the Minsk process was uh, was begun uh, under when Ukraine was under attack, um, and Russia is trying to to do the same thing. It puts its enemy into an extremely weak position by attacking it, and then, uh, you know, when it thinks it's at its lowest point, it tries to negotiate from from a position of uh, great strength. Uh, and I think we really, we really have to recognize what's happening and do everything we can. You know, Western, there, there are Western partners involved and in, have been Western partners involved in these processes. And they have to insist that any talks happen on Ukraine's terms and not just on Russia's terms. You know, if I were President Zelensky, I would be extremely cautious about going to Minsk. Um, you know, we've heard reports that uh, the Russian invasion force has orders to target senior public uh, people in Ukraine. The president is the most senior public person. Um, you know, I'd be very worried about my fate if I were President Zelensky, if, if I were to uh, fall into the hands of the Russians. And going to Minsk, Minsk I think, would be a, a, a great personal risk for him. Um, although he's, he has shown great bravery in staying in Ukraine, despite apparently an offer to, to leave uh, from the Americans, he, he's insisted on staying. He's there. He's community, communicating with the people. Professor William Blacker, thank you very much for your insights and for talking to We On today. Thank you. Every war eventually boils down to numbers, the number of troops, the number of battalions, artillery, armored vehicles, defense spending, all of it. This gives us a sense of what to expect, which side the odds are stacked against, and which side they are tilted to. So. If we look at this in terms of numbers, how do the both or how do both Russian and Ukrainian sides compare? Now, according to the 2022 Global Firepower Index, Russia has a military spending of 61.7 billion US dollars. That's 11.4 percent of its total government spending. In comparison, Ukraine was spending 5.9 billion US dollars on its armed forces. If we speak of military manpower, Russia has 900,000 active personnel. Ukraine has 209,000. Russia has 2 million reserve personnel. Ukraine has 900,000. If we speak of artillery or heavy military ranged weapons, Russia has 7,571. Ukraine has only 2,040. 
When it comes to armored vehicles, Russia has around 30,122 armored vehicles. Ukraine has only 12,303. Russia again has the edge in terms of tanks, the primary offensive weapon of any army. It has over 12,420 tanks compared to 2,596 Ukraine's tanks in Ukraine's arsenal. When it comes to attack helicopters, Russia has 544 of them. Ukraine has just 34. Lastly, the fighter aircraft, the most potent weapon in air-to-air -air combat. Russia again outranks Ukraine here. It has over 1,511 fighter aircrafts. Ukraine has just 98. Weon is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.